In this module, we've been talking a lot about voice over IP, video over IP, unified communications, and we've mentioned once or twice that if we are having voice and or video sitting side by side our data on our networks, we might need to use quality of service. And the best definition I've ever heard of quality of service is that quality of service is managed unfairness. Think about that. That's really what it is we're deliberately being unfair to specific traffic types so that we can give preferential treatment to other traffic types. And in this video, we want to talk about some of the different quality of service mechanisms that are out there to help us. And quality of service itself is a very big study. But here at the Network Plus level, I want you to understand more about what these tools are. And we can break quality of service down into three broad categories. First is IntServe, or integrated services. You might want to jot down in your notes that the quality of service mechanism that gives us integrated services is RSVP, the Resource Reservation Protocol. We also have DiffServe, or differentiated services, and that's mainly what we're going to be using with our voice and video networks. And then we have Best Effort, which I hesitate to even classify as a quality of service category because it's not really doing any preferential treatment of traffic. It's really FIFO. The first packet that comes in is the first packet that goes out. And going back to the bottom of our pyramid, IntServe, think of this as very strict quality of service. Sometimes it's called hard QoS. What we can do with IntServe, or specifically RSVP, is we can set up a reservation between a couple of routers. And we can say that we guarantee that this particular application has this much bandwidth available to it. And we're not going to allow any other application to encroach in on that bandwidth until this application gives it back. Even if that application doesn't need the bandwidth at the moment. We're not going to share. We're not going to let anybody else have any of that bandwidth. DiffServe, however, is kinder and gentler. We think of this as soft QoS. It's less strict. With DiffServe, we're literally, as the name suggests, differentiating between different traffic flows. And we can assign a policy to those different traffic types. And a policy might say, we guarantee that you can have at least this much bandwidth. The policy might say, you get to go first. The policy might say, we're going to set a speed limit on you. You're not allowed to go over this amount of bandwidth. And there are other examples of policies as well, but those are some of the main ones. And DiffServe is going to be what we're mainly going to be focusing on in our discussion. And best effort, it's really not strict at all. It's FIFO. It's first in, first out. The first packet that comes into the router is the first packet to go out of the router. There is no reordering of packets. There is no prioritization. But it is considered to be a category of quality of service. It's almost the absence of quality of service. Now, let's take a look at some common quality of service mechanisms. One of the first things we should do when we're setting up quality of service is to configure classification and marking. You see, if we can recognize a packet as being a particular type of packet, you are a voice packet, you are a video packet, you're a network gaming packet that we don't want to treat very well, possibly. If we can recognize or classify traffic very early on in its travels, then we can mark it. We can go in and alter bits in the layer 2 and or the layer 3 header and give it a marking so when it hits the next switch or the next router, that router or switch is not going to have to make another evaluation about the type of traffic this is. It can just very quickly, very efficiently look at that marking and make a decision based on that marking, like a forwarding decision or a dropping decision. The metaphor I used to give my students was, think of an airline boarding pass. When you're getting on an airline, the airlines often board the first class passengers and maybe the business class passengers, maybe their frequent flyer passengers, and then they might start boarding in zones, filling up from the rear of the plane to the front of the plane. And even though I am a member of a frequent flyer program, I've not quite reached that pinnacle of being a frequent flyer. I don't get to board ahead of other passengers. But let's pretend that day finally comes, and let's say that I've earned my frequent flyer status, and I go up to the attendant, scanning the tickets, and just as I'm about to board, they say, Hello, Mr. Wallace, before you can get on the plane, we would like you to prove that you're really a frequent flyer. We would like you to produce your boarding passes from the time you went to San Jose, San Diego, Chicago, Dallas, Austin, Orlando. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine me having to prove every single time I got on the plane that I really was a frequent flyer? That's not very efficient, is it? No, instead, they just look at the marking that's on my boarding pass. And that marking indicates whether or not I'm considered to be a frequent flyer. 
that's what we can do with our voice data and video traffic. We can assign it a marking, giving it a certain priority level. But just classifying and marking traffic by itself doesn't really alter the behavior of traffic. We need other mechanisms to look at those markings and make decisions based on those markings. One such mechanism is a queuing mechanism. Here's what queuing is all about. Visualize this if you would. Imagine that we have a router and we're coming into the router from a high speed LAN. Maybe a gig link is coming into that router, but we're leaving on a relatively low speed WAN link. Maybe it's a T1 as an extreme example. We're coming in at a gigabit per second and we're trying to leave at 1.544 megabits per second. That's a pretty serious speed mismatch. What happens if the router is receiving traffic faster than it can send it out on the wide area network? Well, the outgoing router interface is able to allocate some memory called a buffer or sometimes called a queue. And it's going to store packets temporarily in that memory until hopefully bandwidth demand on the WAN is going to die down and then the router is going to take the packets out of the queue and it's going to send them on their way. Well, if we're just doing FIFO, the best effort approach to quality of service, we're saying that the first packet that got put into the queue is the first packet that gets sent out of the queue. But generally, when we're experiencing congestion like that, that's where we want quality of service to do its unfair management of packet treatment. We might want to send our voice and video packets out ahead of our data packets. We've got all those different packets sitting in the queue, but we want to send the voice and the video, the latency sensitive traffic first. That's one thing that queuing allows us to do. And queuing is a fairly complex topic. There are different variants of queuing mechanisms, but as a simple metaphor, let's imagine that we've taken that memory available to the router's output interface and we've split it between a couple of buckets. We've got one bucket where we're going to deposit voice over IP packets and another bucket where we're going to put everybody else. Let's pretend we don't have video. We've got voice and we've got everything else. Well, let's say that the voice packets are going into the voice bucket. Everything else is going into the best effort bucket. And let's imagine that there's a burst of data on the local area network. So much so that that best effort bucket fills to capacity and it overflows. I mean, it's of a finite size. We can only store so many packets in this queue. Well, the best effort bucket is overflowing, but the voice over IP bucket is not overflowing because we've done queue separation. By putting the voice packets in the voice over IP bucket, they're not being discarded like our data is being discarded. We still have room for the voice traffic and we can still send it first out ahead of the best effort traffic. Another mechanism we have is congestion avoidance. We talked about how that best effort bucket could fill to capacity and start to overflow because it had become completely congested. Well, we might want to avoid congestion because when a queue is congested, there are some really ugly side effects that happen. Not only do we start discarding traffic because a queue is full, TCP traffic actually slows down. Remember we talked earlier about the TCP window size? Well, the window size is going to be reduced because TCP is going to conclude that if I'm dropping packets, then I must be sending too aggressively. I'm going to back off my window size and we send less efficiently. We want to avoid congestion and there is an industry standard approach to doing this and it's called RED, RED, Random Early Detection. By the way, Cisco has their own variant of this. It's called Weighted Random Early Detection, WRED. But RED, as Random Early Detection suggests, is going to randomly throw packets away to prevent congestion from happening. As the queue gets deeper and deeper, specifically after it crosses a specific threshold that we can define, then red is going to start getting a bit more nervous. It's going to say, I think I need to start throwing packets away more and more aggressively as the queue depth gets greater, as there are more and more packets in that queue. And the metaphor that I often offer my students when describing red or weighted red is my favorite Star Trek movie. My favorite Star Trek movie is Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan. Remember Ricardo Montalban was Khan and he's damaged the Enterprise and Spock goes down to the engine room to repair the warp drive and in doing so he's radiated and he's blind and he's dying and Kirk comes down to the engine room and he goes up to the glass and he says, Spock! And Spock comes over to the glass and he says, ship, out of danger and Kirk says, Yes, and they go on to have this conversation where Kirk is asking him, why did you do it, Spock? Why did you give your life to save the Enterprise? And Spock says, and I paraphrase, 
don't grieve, Admiral, it's logical. With Red, the needs of the many outweigh, and then Kirk says, the needs of the few. That's what Red is doing. Red is sacrificing the few packet flows. It's discarding some packets randomly and causing a few flows to go into TCP slow start to start using bandwidth less efficiently so that everybody doesn't have to suffer. So the queue does not fill to capacity and start to overflow and start discarding packets from all of the flows. We're sacrificing the few for the good of the many. And I mentioned that Cisco had their own variant of that. It was a weighted random early detection. With weighted red, the router can actually pay attention to those markings that we talked about early on. It can be more aggressive in dropping lower priority traffic. So that's a nice enhancement to traditional red. Another category of quality of service mechanisms we have is policing and shaping. Queuing, on one hand, can guarantee a minimum amount of bandwidth is going to be available to specific applications. On the other hand, policing and shaping can set a speed limit. It can say that an application is not allowed to take up more than a certain amount of bandwidth. And while policing and shaping both have a similar mission statement, the policing is more strict. The default behavior of many policing implementations is... If traffic tries to exceed a certain amount of bandwidth, it tries to consume more than that bandwidth, the default behavior is to throw excess traffic away. I compare it to that uh, that episode of Seinfeld. Do you remember where you go in and you try to order soup, and if you don't order soup correctly, the guy says, no soup for you, come back one week. That's really what policing is doing. Policing is saying, no bandwidth for you, come back. Literally, it's telling the traffic to come back if it's TCP traffic, because TCP traffic, once it's dropped, based on the acknowledgement messages, it's going to have to be reset. It's going to have to come back. So policing is very strict. Shaping is the kinder and gentler approach. If we try to exceed our set amount of bandwidth, which is often referred to as the CIR, the committed information rate, if we try to exceed that with a shaping configuration, shaping says, I'm so sorry. I don't have enough bandwidth to send you at the moment, but please don't go anywhere. Please just sit here and relax. And we're storing the packets in a queue. And then when the bandwidth demand dies down on the WAN, perhaps, then we'll take the packets out of the queue and we'll send them on their way. So shaping is delaying traffic. It's letting traffic sit and relax, and then it sends the traffic on when bandwidth is available. While policing just says, no bandwidth for you, and the traffic is dropped, and it has to be retransmitted. And there's one other category of quality of service mechanisms we want to talk about, and that's link efficiency. We're trying to make the most efficient use of a WAN link with relatively limited bandwidth. And a couple of major link efficiency tools are compression and link fragmentation and interleaving. First, let's think about compression. Would you agree with this statement? If I can compress down the size of my packet without losing any data, in other words, I'm not doing lossy compression, would you agree that by compressing the data down, It's almost like getting free bandwidth. I'm able to send more data or voice or video using the same amount of bandwidth. Absolutely, compression is almost like getting free bandwidth. And I say almost because there is a bit of a trade-off because we have to throw some processor cycles at compression. The router might have to do some extra work with its processor in order to run the compression algorithm. There is stack compression, predictor compression. But here in the Unified Communications module, let's think not about compressing big data payloads. Let's think about compressing the header of a voice packet. Do you remember the protocol that carries voice? It's RTP, the Real-Time Transport Protocol. And let's say that we're using G.729 as our codec. Well, by default in many implementations, the size of the voice media is 20 bytes. If you look in that packet, only 20 bytes of that packet contains the actual voice. Now think about the overhead. At layer 3, we've got the overhead of an IP header. At layer 4, we've got the overhead of a UDP header and an RTP header. If you add those headers up, we've got 40 bytes of header. Compare 40 bytes of header to only 20 bytes of payload. That's not a great ratio, but we can save a significant amount of bandwidth if we do RTP header compression, where we logically squeeze down that 40 byte header. And we can squeeze it down to two bytes or four bytes. Many systems default to two bytes. It's four bytes if you have a UDP checksum and it's two bytes if you don't. And I said that we're compressing the header. Well, to be technically accurate, It's not so much compression as it is caching. You see, as voice packets are flowing between a couple of routers, the router can look at the headers on those packets and say, a lot of this information looks really familiar. 
I mean, look at this. Every single packet as part of this voice flow seems to have the same source and destination IP address. It's got the same source and destination UDP port number. It's got the same RTP payload type. We're sending all of this redundant information in every single packet. That doesn't seem necessary, does it? So if we enable RTP header compression, the routers at each end of a link make a copy of all that header information and they store it locally. And that way, they don't have to send that big 40-byte header for every single packet between the routers. We send a 2-byte header, perhaps. And inside of that 2-byte header, there's an identifier. It's called the Session Context ID, which is abbreviated CID. And that identifies this packet as belonging to a particular voice call. After all, we could have multiple voice calls going between the routers. If we don't have that header information, how do we tell them apart? Well, it's that session context ID information that distinguishes one call from another. And when I've set this up before, sometimes enabling RTP header compression allows me to double the number of voice calls going across a WAN link using the same amount of bandwidth. And I have seen it, and this can vary depending on how much bandwidth you have, the type of codec you're using, the packetization rate, but I've seen RTP header compression triple the call carrying capacity, triple the number of calls that I can place over a single WAN link without going out and buying extra bandwidth. That's why it's called a link efficiency mechanism. The other link efficiency mechanism that we have is sometimes called LFI, link fragmentation and interleaving. Here's the idea. If we're going out a relatively slow speed WAN link, and we've got a big data packet, maybe a 1500 byte data packet that we're trying to send out of that router, it could take a non-trivial amount of time to do that. And let's imagine that we've got this big 1500 byte packet that we're trying to send out of the router on a slow speed WAN link and stuck behind that packet is a fairly small voice packet. The metaphor that I give my students is this. Imagine a big triple or here we have a double tractor trailer truck sitting at a traffic light. And imagine we've got a little tiny sports car behind that truck. And when the traffic light turns green, the first trailer goes through and the second trailer goes through. And maybe by the time the little sports car gets to the traffic light, maybe it's turned red again. You see the little tiny payload, the sports car, is being delayed by the big payload. But what if we did this? What if we took those, in this case, two trailers and put them behind their own tractor. In other words, we've got two separate tractor trailer vehicles. If we had tractor trailer number one and tractor trailer number two, and then our sports car behind that, and the light turns green, well, that little sports car, it's nimble, it's agile. It might be able to weave its way in front of one of those trucks anyway, and get through the interface, get through the traffic light quicker. That's what we can do with link fragmentation and interleaving. We can take a big data packet and we can bust it up. And then, just like we're shuffling a deck of cards, we can shuffle in our little tiny voice packets in amongst the now fragmented data packets. And as a result, the voice packets can get out of the interface sooner. Now, there is a point where it's better not to do this. After all, in my metaphor where we suddenly had two tractor trailers on the road, did you notice that we actually increased our bandwidth demand? If we think of the truck as the header, well, if I've got two packets, now I've got two headers instead of just one header. I've actually increased the bandwidth demand. But it's generally considered okay to do that for voice calls if, and here's the magic number, if the link speed is less than 768 kilobits per second. That's the magic number. If you go through the math, you see that if we had a 1500 byte packet trying to get out of a 768k interface, it would take 10 milliseconds to do that and that's considered acceptable. Anything less than 768K, and suddenly it would take more than 10 milliseconds to get out of that interface. That's where it starts to pay off to bust up our data packets and shuffle in our little tiny voice packets. Well, that's a look at some of the quality of service mechanisms that we might implement in our network. We might implement these mechanisms on switches and our routers. And please understand that quality of service is not a fix for buying extra bandwidth. If we are congested all the time, if we're congested 24-7, we probably need extra bandwidth. But if we have periods of temporary congestion, much like rush hour on the highway, if we've got those periods of time where we're congested, but we're not congested most of the time, that's where quality of service can really help us out. If we're temporarily congested, we might consider implementing quality of service so that we can manage how unfair we're being, like we talked about, with our different traffic types. 